And I call the Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with your permission, I would like to answer questions one and six together. I am committed to ensuring that the law provides for the most effective protection for victims of stalking and that it is progressed as a matter of urgency. I have met with victims of stalking and have heard of the horrendous experiences that they have been subjected to. I want to make sure that victims of this insidious crime will be able to get the justice and protection they so desperately need and deserve. That is why I am pleased to report that the drafting of the Protection from Stalking Bill is nearing completion, and my intention is to introduce the Bill to the Assembly in December. This will be a standalone Bill which is focused on introducing a specific offence of stalking and includes a provision for the introduction of stalking protection orders which will offer victims of stalking immediate protection from the perpetrator. I would like thank the Minister uh, for her answer and I am delighted to hear of the progress she is making in the drafting of the Bill. Could the Minister outline to the House her vision of what the central components of such legislation uh, should be? Well, first of all, um, as I said in the original answer, um, the intention would be that, first of all, there are protections for victims of stalking and that those would be included in the bill, but also that the definition of stalking um, would be clarified in law. At the moment, as you know, that th there can be issues in terms of the use of the harassment laws um, in order to be able to prosecute actions of stalking um, behaviour. So this would set, I think, a clearer course, um, a more specific offence in terms of stalking, but then also offer protections that mean that it would, for example, lie with the PSNI to take forward um, the stalking protection orders rather than the, the individual themselves having to seek a non-molestation order, which I think most members recognise can be quite challenging. Call Christopher Stolford. Thank you, sir, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Uh, I do welcome the fact that this legislation is due to be coming forward in December. Every person should be free from stalking or harassment. The Minister will know that a crucial element of any propositions that make their way to the statute book is a sufficient budget available to allow for speedy access to justice in this area. Has the Department made any estimate as to what the financial requirement would be to ensure the implementation of this welcome legislation? Well, I thank um, the member for his question. I think the issue here is one not of, if you like, creating new duties um, and obligations which will lead to increased costs, but the actual um, issue is about um, improving access to the law where currently access is difficult, for example, by using the harassment um, provisions that are already in statute. So we don't anticipate that there will necessarily be huge costs because obviously one of the issues um, in terms of delivering this is that where people seek um, protection from harassment um, as things stand, those can often lead to very complicated and protracted cases in court. By simplifying the offence, it should make it easier um, for people to, to get the protections that they need. There will, of course, be some transfer of responsibility because in terms of seeking a non-molestation order, um, the financial um, obligations lie with the person who applies. And whilst they may be able to get some um, assistance through legal aid, depending on their means, um, this would then fall to the PSNI. However, that is one of the issues that we would be looking at in terms of how we budget on, on going forward. We do not anticipate um, that there will be a, a significant increase in cost. Here I'm Sarah Linda Dillon. For when you cash, they call Linda Dillon. And can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far? And, and she has highlighted some of the issues that would be of greatest concern to us. And you have spoke to what is available at the moment in terms of harassment and intimidation legislation. And we know that the sentences in relation to those can be quite lenient. So can the Minister give some assurances around that the sentences for in relation to the stock and bill will reflect the seriousness of the crime? I think, it's absolutely, um, I think it's absolutely crucial that they do, um, and that is a matter which, um, as a member of the Justice Committee, um, the member will have the opportunity to scrutinise in some detail when the bill comes forward. Um, I think, it is also, um, I think it's also um, indicative of where we are headed. We are in intending on a stalking offence quite similar um, in structure to the model that is applying in Scotland at the moment, uh, which was introduced in 2010. Um, so I think we will have um, I think we will have an opportunity um, through the experience of Scotland to be able to inform our policy basis here. I call Paula Bradshaw. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, given that Northern Ireland will be the only jurisdiction in the UK with its own standalone stocking bill, how will our offence compare with that in the other parts of the UK? Thank you. I think it's important for us to seek to build the most robust um, preventions for stalking that we can in legislation, and we do that by comparing what other jurisdictions have already on statute. I think that this is, from our perspective, one way of making sure that our provisions will be more robust. But also, I am bringing it forward as a, as a significant piece of legislation, but a standalone piece of legislation, because there was the option for us to incorporate it, for example, into the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, which is going through today. But I think there were two issues with that that would have caused me some concern. The first is that it conflates domestic abuse and stalking, and not everyone who is stalked is a victim of domestic abuse. In fact, often stalkers have nothing to do with the domestic setting and have no prior relationship with the individual who is stalked. I think that is a very important issue um, in terms of clarity for the public. But also, I think that it would have risked stalking um, not being given the adequate attention that it needs to be given um, in order to be able to be properly screened recognised by the committee. And so I think by creating a standalone offence, it allows us also um, to take the time to ensure that the training um, is, is appropriate for the justice agencies who will have to deliver um, on the offence and actually implement it once it's been created. I call Andy Allen for a question. Question to you, Deputy Speaker. Mr Speaker, the seizure of illegal fireworks is an operational matter for the PSNI and for the Chief Constable. They have advised that the number of incidents where the PSNI have seized fireworks over the last four years is as follows. 148 in 2016-17, 120 in 2017-18, 129 in 2018-19 and 149 in 2019-20. The number of fireworks seized in each incident is not counted. The law is clear on the purchase, possession and use of fireworks. A licence is required to buy, sell or use fireworks. It is an offence to buy or sell fireworks without one. I would encourage anyone who has any information about the sale of illegal fireworks to report it to the PSNI or the Charity Crime Stoppers. Uh, Andy Allen for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. Minister, and I appreciate you've pointed out that it is an operational matter, matter for the PSNI. However, Minister, uh, I and I'm sure many others have, continue to be contacted by constituents who are raising concerns about the legal sale of fireworks, and it is important that where people have information that they, they do pass that on to the PSNI. We have also seen recent examples of the dangers of fireworks in the media as well. And, and I wanted to ask, Minister, what engagement you have had with executive colleagues around the educational piece uh, in highlighting to our young people uh, the dangers of fireworks? Well, I thank the member for his question. To date, I have had no um, proactive, investigation or proactive um, interaction personally uh, with executive colleagues in this matter. However, I am aware that Belfast City Council, at the request um, of one of my colleagues is now taking forward um, an issue around public education around fireworks um, and also educating people better around the law. It is something that was passed um, at a recent committee um, on the 24th of January, in fact, in the Policy and Resources Committee in Belfast City Council. And obviously, they also have a role in terms of developing community strategies um, through the PCSPs and others in order to address those issues. Here, Mr. Emma Rubin for your case. I call Emma Rubin. Carmi, my question has been answered. Call Colin McGrath. Here, Mr. Colin McGrath for your case. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, given that the councils are able to carry out a role and the police, could I urge the Minister to deliver some sort of uh, policy or overarching strategy to manage this issue? In my constituency, um, there is the flying horse model farm. From as much as eight to ten weeks before Halloween, people are having fireworks thrown at them, cars are having fireworks thrown at them, and people are being tortured. We need to do what we can to stop the number of fireworks uh, well in advance of Halloween, and if it needs an interim agency approach, would the Minister consider this? Yes, of course, I would consider any approach, and I am happy to work with other executive colleagues to address the issue. Um, I was simply making members aware that the PCSPs and the councils are already, in some cases, doing quite substantive pieces of work around community information. But it is an issue that I, I recognise is serious. I know that, from my own department's point of view, the law is robust in this regard, but part of the issue, um, as Mr Allen originally said, is that we need to get that information to the PSNI and to, as to where fireworks are being sold um, and bought illegally 
legally, because I think that that will make a huge difference. And, Mr. Speaker, if I may, there are also, I think, some things that um, central government can do. Um, fireworks can be produced that are lower noise, for example, and we know the distress that fireworks can cause to young children, to pets, to people with, um, with sensory um, issues, and so on. So it is incredibly important that all avenues are pursued when we look at the issue of fireworks, including keeping people safe um, and free of harm and abuse. In terms of antisocial behaviour, you will be aware that we are reviewing um, the position with regard to antisocial behaviour, and this is obviously one element of antisocial behaviour that needs to be considered. Call Alan Chambers for a question. Uh, question three, uh, Mr. Deputy Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, in 2017, 126 prisoners were held for more than 10 days in the Macabre Care and Supervision Unit, in 2018, 145 prisoners, and in 2019, 158 prisoners. Some of these prisoners may have been held in the unit on more than one occasion. These figures need to be taken in context with the number of people committed to Macabre Prison in those years. In 2017, there were 3,083 people committed. In 2018, the number was 3,224, and there were 3,344 in 2019. The Northern Ireland Prison Service takes its responsibility for the safety and well-being of all the people in its care very seriously. Care and supervision units play an important role in each of our prisons as places where individuals can be kept apart from the general population in the interest of good order and discipline or for their own protection or the protection of others. They also provide an environment for tailored care and interaction planning, partner agency engagement, signposting and referrals to assist in addressing underlying issues leading to harmful behaviour. An individual may be placed in the CSU as a result of breaching prison rules, including engaging in harmful behaviours, violence, disruptive, aggressive or antisocial behaviour, and drug-seeking, taking or trafficking. Every case is considered on an individual basis, and there is a stringent and transparent process in place to manage and review all cases. The Independent Monitoring Board is also advised when a person is placed in the CSU. Prisoners are only held in the CSU for such a time as is considered to be absolutely necessary, and the initial period of restriction will not exceed 72 hours. Any request to extend this time will only be recommended following a multidisciplinary case review chaired by a governor and will include the individual themselves. This is then considered by an authorising officer from outside of that prison who will interview the prisoner as part of the process should there be a recommendation for extension. All cases are reviewed weekly through the CSU's manager's weekly assessment, which allows for any application to be ended if the specific circumstances change. Mr Chambers for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister. And I welcome that the Criminal Justice Inspectorate will now conduct a review of care and supervision units. But it's a shame that it took an article in the detail to begin such a review. But can the Minister account for the reason why the number of prisoners held in care and supervision units has increased from 585 in 2015 to 755 in 2019? Thank you. Yes, Mr Speaker, I can. As you will know, um, the prison in Mugabe had a very poor record when it came. It was, re it was once referred to as the most dangerous prison in Europe. And as a result of very hard work by the prison service in order to keep its officers safe and in order to keep the general prison population safe, the use of the CSU, not as, as some have said, by the way, because it's important, in the detail, it was said that this was solitary confinement. It is not solitary confinement. People in CSU still have access to other individuals. They still get exercise outdoors. They still have access to the gym. They still have access um, to the health trust. They still have prison visits. This is not, by any stretch of the imagination, solitary confinement. And I would correct the member. The, the Criminal Justice Inspectorate have inspected McGabry Prison on a number of occasions, and that includes the CSU, and has given it a clean bill of health as it has in every other prison. So it is not the case that we have invited in the Criminal Justice Inspector in order to placate um, those who have said that this is um, not well run. We have asked them to come in because we are confident that their report will show that the article which was published and suggested that this is in some way, um, th that this is um, akin 
um, to uh, people being held in solitary confinement is not the case. That is also reflected in the comments of the current um, prisoner ombudsman, who has looked at the CSUs, visited the CSU, as I have myself, and I can assure members that I would not tolerate people being held for long periods of time in solitary confinement. I have witnessed the work of CSU. I have witnessed the dedication of the officers who work in the CSU. In terms of trying to turn around prisoners, not only with very complex needs, but incredibly dangerous prisoners, both to themselves and to other members of the prison population. And it is important if we are going to rehabilitate people that we do so in a context where we are able to do it as best as possible. A disruptive prisoner in the main prison fails to allow the normal prison regime to continue and to rehabilitate other prisoners. It also means that we cannot tailor on a one-to-one -one basis the rehabilitation support that is provided to the individuals in the way that we can in CSU. Last Concordia, um, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. I also welcome the announcement of the Sajini review into CSUs across the north. Um, will the Minister indicate a time frame for the completion of these reviews? I will have to write to the member um, with some more information on that. I do not have the time frame in front of me. However, it is intended to be a short, sharp review because Sajini have already visited all of the CSUs um, in quite recent history when they do the normal uh, reviews of the prison. Call Pat Catney. You and Mr. Pat Catney. I've got a wave at Glasgow College. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, I was wondering what programmes are in place to support those with uh, poor mental health who are referred to the current supervision unit. There are a number um, of, of, of options for dealing with people in the current supervision unit. Um, there are distraction packs, um, there are support um, and signposting to mental health. Um, there is one-to-one -one, um, work between the prison officers themselves and the individuals in the CSU. I mean, people need to be realistic. We are dealing with a very complex prison population, some of whom have multiple needs um, that have not been addressed before they, re they, re they arrived in prison. But not all of those individuals are easy to work with. Often they are violent offenders. Often they have complex issues. And so we have to protect both our prison staff and other members um, of the prison population um, from the risks at which they would be placed. We also have a duty of care, Mr Speaker, to those individuals themselves who have complex needs to ensure that they are not a harm to themselves. I have witnessed in my discussions, for example, uh, with the prison service, some of the drugs that people um, try to bring into the prison system secreted within their body. And if those drugs were to make it into the, prison, into the main prison system, it would be carnage, not just for prison officers, but for other prisoners. And in order to get those drugs, people have to be held in a dry cell in order that those drugs can be retrieved. That, unfortunately, can take a protracted period of time due to the intimidation and threat that many of those drugs mules are under to bring those drugs securely into the prison. And therefore, it is often for their own protection that they have to be held for longer periods of time than we would ideally like in order to ensure that those drugs do not make their way into the main prison population. And these are not, these are not minor issues. These are significant hauls of drugs that are, are caught in the CSU. But there are also those with mental health issues, and the member quite rightly says what they need is additional care and therapeutic support. And I have to say that I have been hugely impressed by the work of the South Eastern Health Care Trust in terms of how they engage proactively around mental health in the prisons generally, but also in terms of working with those with very complex needs within the CSU environment. Call Rachel Wood. Speaker, Minister, you'll be aware that I've been asking lots of questions on CSUs for some time now, and I agree with you, this is complex. But in terms of the drugs, only surely this supports the need for body, sc body scanners to be implemented in our prisons to, in order to weed out the ones that are carrying it as the ones that are not. Um, but the Independent Monitoring Board was mentioned, and the IMB play a cru crucial role in inspecting CSUs, monitoring their use and speaking to prisoners, yet their volunteers' work is often hampered by not having remote access to communications facilities, and they have to travel to McGabry to pick up an email. So, Minister, when will your department provide volunteers with adequate, secure, remote IT systems that can assist their work, especially in the context of COVID-19 and your recently announced review of CSUs? Well, I'm happy to look into that issue and come back to the member with a, with a time frame around this issue, but it's not only, I have to say, um, the, inter, the, the mon independent monitoring board 
who monitor our CSUs. As I've already said, so Jenny have looked at our CSUs, um, and also um, it was recently described as an example of international best practice by the International Committee for the Red Cross. So I think that they are thoroughly, um, they are thoroughly supervised and scrutinised, um, but I'm more than happy to increase the scrutiny because I believe that that's in everyone's interest. And I think it, it prevents a misunderstanding about what actually happens within the prison system. I call Michelle McElveen for a question. Question for Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'd like to answer question four and question five together, please. <clears throat> the review of civil and family justice is being considered as part of an evolving civil and family justice modernisation programme, which is one of a number of reform initiatives being progressed by my department. Consideration of review recommendations is in itself a significant undertaking. Collectively, the reports contain around 400 wide-ranging recommendations, which vary from minor technical and procedural issues to substantive reforms. Not all of the recommendations are from my department. Around two-thirds are matters for the judiciary, the legal profession and other departments. Of the areas that fall to justice, I want to ensure that my department prioritises areas which are likely to generate the greatest benefits for our citizens. We have made some good progress, including the additional protections for vulnerable court users being introduced through the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, and a joint action plan being developed with health to improve outcomes for families involved in private family law proceedings. This represents a good start, but clearly more needs to be done, and I am working with my officials to prioritise future actions within our existing resources. I call Michelle McElveen for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the um, response from the Minister. The review was published in 2017. Has the Minister cost to the recommendations which fall within her remit? And given that a number of the recommendations contain a raft of proposals which include greater digitalisation and use of modern technology, with the onset of COVID, the use of technology for virtual court hearings has increased. What steps will the Minister's Department take to enhance the use of technology during the pandemic and beyond? Well, I thank the member for the supplementary. Um, as I said, we will have to deal with the Gillen Review as we do with most issues, Mr Speaker, on the basis that we have to live within our existing budgets. And unfortunately, that is a stark reality which faces the Justice Department, but also many other executive departments. And that is likely, I think, only to become more of a challenge um, after this COVID crisis, because I suspect the Treasury will now be looking um, at how it recovers um, from some of the expenditure that it has been forced to make um, over the last number of months. So it is a stark reality and it does of course hamper um, what we are able to do. However, on the issue particularly of the use of technology, it is something that I have to say that has been a good outcome of COVID um, and there are very few of those. Um, but I think that what we have had to do, necessity has been the mother of invention. Um, and so instead of having the resistance often of people in the justice system um, to the use of remote technology, we have had a willingness to engage on that issue in order to ensure that the courts are competent and are able to continue to deliver justice um, or over that period. It is certainly my view and that of the, of the Criminal Justice Board and also, I believe, um, those involved in civil proceedings and that we would capture the benefits that we have gained as a result of COVID in terms of development of technology and ensure that those are embedded into the system going forward. Well, Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm sure the, the member for Strangford will agree with me on this question. Great minds think alike. Um, given the seriousness of the issue and given the length of time since the Gillen Review, I know the Minister will agree that urgent action is required, given that some of the important recommendations will require specific legislation. So can the Minister give us an absolute guarantee that she will bring the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill before the House before the end of the mandate? Well, um, Mr Speaker, I have said many times um, over the last week, though for different reasons, um, that it is impossible to give guarantees because none of us can see into the future. However, standing here with um, the longest view I have, um, I can certainly give him my guarantee that I will do my best to get that miscellaneous provisions bill to the committee. And we are certainly on track to do that. Um, and we would hope to have it with the committee um, and with the assembly um, early um, next year, probably March. Um, so I can't give cast iron guarantees because I don't know what will happen. Um, in terms of the issue, um, I, I also want to mention about the issue of cost because it was raised um, by his colleague. Um, there is also a saving, of course, to the justice system 
if we are able to use remote technology, because while it requires an upfront investment, it also saves us in other places. And so I think there is the opportunity for us to, within our means, um, see some recoup of the money that we spend, for example, transporting people um, around the countryside for hearings that are then adjourned. We've, we've seen new and more agile ways of working, uh, where adjournments are now done on an administrative basis prior to people's attendance at court. I think all of those things have been long overdue, and if COVID has delivered them, then I think we now need to embed them as part of the justice system going forward. But I agree with the member, there is, a, there is an urgency. However, not all of the issues require legislation. And I would want to reassure him of that. There are many issues where it is about procedures and practice. And what we will try to do um, through, the, through the cooperation and collaboration um, with the other justice agencies is to ensure that we, ins- that we have the best possible practice um, in place in order to minimise delay um, as we take these recommendations forward. Here I'm sorry, Sean Lynch, for your cash, I call. I'll get the uh, minister has answered my question. Okay, uh, we now move to uh, Doug Beattie for a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, question seven, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the term politically motivated offender is not used to describe any specific cadre of offender released on licence within our community. On the, on the 8th of September 2020, under my direction, the Department introduced multi-agency review arrangements to support the classification and management of the risks posed by individuals considered to be terrorist-related offenders. These arrangements provide a platform for Probation Board uh, for Northern Ireland, Police Service of Northern Ireland, Prison Service and officials within the Department to work together for this cadre of offender to give effect to the purpose of licence supervision namely to protect the public from harm, to reduce reoffending, and to support the rehabilitation of the offender. Once classified as a terrorist-related offender, individuals will be required to apply through the interim arrangements to secure approval to change address within Northern Ireland and or the rest of the United Kingdom, to travel to other jurisdictions within and or outside the United Kingdom, and to permanent reset, re, permanently resettle outside of Northern Ireland. The Probation Board for Northern Ireland is an integral partner within these arrangements. Probation contributes towards decisions surrounding the classification of individuals as terrorist-related offenders and also considering and advising on the potential impact on resettlement and social welfare support relating to decisions surrounding change of address, travel or permanent resettlement. The interim arrangements provide a basis for relevant information to be shared across justice organisations to enable balanced decisions to be reached which uh, which contribute towards protecting the public from harm whilst also supporting the resettlement of the offender into society. Doug Beatty for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and I thank the Minister for keeping me right uh, on terminology. And, and I did notice that I had that wrong, whereas I was calling it terrorist motivated offenders, um, but it's now terrorist related uh, offenders. Um, but could I ask the Minister, um, given the fact is that um, our probation board, who provide a fantastic service, uh, do find themselves in difficulties when they become under threat by terrorist organisations, which means they have to withdraw their services from certain parts uh, of Northern Ireland. What are we doing to future-proof that so it doesn't happen uh, in the future uh, and that um, the probation board can do its job in these areas where threats may exist? Well, Mr Speaker, I think that the member makes a, a very important point. Anyone who works within our justice system can face threats and intimidation from terrorist offenders. And the reason that I use terrorist offenders as opposed to politically motivated is simply because I don't accept that these people have political motivation. I think they're motivated by self-interest um, and abuse of their community. So I, I don't think we should give any traction um, to the view that they have political ambitions or that those political ambitions in any way um, are a cover for their offending. Prior to the arrangements that we introduced in September um, through the multi-agency um, review uh, approach, Probation already engaged with terrorist-related offenders to provide resettlement and welfare support, but the member is, of course, correct um, that due to threats and intimidation, that became very difficult. Probation Board is good at its job because they are, first of all, unlike in other parts of this ju- of the UK, um, they are all qualified social workers, so their focus is on rehabilitation and social support but also because they are from and live in the communities uh, where they manage offenders and therefore they are passionate about doing the job well. It does make them, I have to say, more vulnerable perhaps to some of those um, who would rather not be supervised um, about their activities when they leave. 
Licence conditions supporting public protection have been monitored by the Police Service for Northern Ireland in any event uh, with terrorist-related offenders. And in addition, we are increasing the use of electronic monitoring um, to enhance measures to protect the public from a risk of harm proposed by, uh, posed by terrorist-related offenders. And I hope that the robustness of the new arrangements uh, will actually allow us to do that in a much more effective um, and a much more equitable way. And that ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, will the Minister give her assessment of the need for a definition of harm? Mr Speaker, I must apologise. I didn't actually hear the member's question. Sorry, uh, my apologies. Will the Minister give her assessment of a definition of harm in law? Mr Speaker, um, without further information as to exactly what the member is asking, it would be very difficult um, in terms of being able to answer a question because I'm unclear as to what the um, premise of it is. Perhaps the member would use your supplementary then to clarify. Well, um, I, I'm thinking, Minister, of the, one of the amendments tabled by Mr Jim Allister in respect to harm versus action. And harm tends to be uh, something that is felt by the victim, but there's, no necess there's not necessarily any definition within law. So would she um, feel that it might be useful for, for this law and indeed others to poten potentially work towards creating a definition for harm or maybe an index? Mr Speaker, in respect of the um, Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, the purpose of the bill is to criminalise the actions, um, not the impact um, of, of, the, uh, of the person's abusive behaviour. I think if we try to criminalise impact, that becomes very difficult. So, for example, then you would be saying that it wasn't an offence to drive your car without, a seat belt, or without wearing a seatbelt or to drive your car intoxicated, provided there was no damage caused. I think that would be a very dangerous course of action. Of course, harm is a consideration when it comes to sentencing, but it is the intent to commit an offence, and it is the recklessness with respect to the harm that is likely to be felt by others that we are trying to capture within the bill, not actually criminalising um, the impact, but criminalising the behaviour itself. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, as the Minister will be aware, the Northern Ireland Policing Board has exhausted its investigation into Jerry Kelly's outrageous tweet about the May's escape without reaching any conclusion, and that it now falls to the, uh, the Minister to decide whether to remove him from the Board. Would the Minister agree that public confidence in the Board is the most important consideration in her determination? Mr Speaker, I am aware indeed um, that this has been exhausted um, by the Policing Board and that they have taken a, a look at whether or not, um, as under their procedures they should, an informal resolution could be reached. None of those who were complainants were willing um, to uh, seek an informal resolution. So that is what exhausted um, the processes of the Board. I said at the time that I found Mr Kelly's comments both offensive and thoroughly inappropriate. I ask that he reaffirm his commitment to non-violence and exclusively peaceful and democratic means, consistent with his responsibilities both as a member of the Policing Board and as a member of this Legislative Assembly. When the incident occurred, I took the view that any investigation into whether Mr Kelly is in breach of the Policing Board Code of Conduct is a matter for the Board to consider in the first instance. That investigation by the Board is now concluded without resolution and has been referred for me uh, to me for consideration under the powers available to me in the Police Northern Ireland Act 2000 to remove a member from the board. I am currently considering, um, based on legal advice, which action I should take, and I am not in a position to make any further comment in that regard at this time. Supplementary for Mr Chambers. Well, uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As the Minister has alluded, uh, she does have the power under the Police Northern Ireland Act uh, to, uh, uh, it, uh, and I quote, uh, if someone is unfit to discharge their functions as a member of the board, you can remove them. Uh, given his tweet and the earlier well publicised use of boat colours to remove a legally placed wheel clamp on his vehicle, in what way does the minister think that Mr Kelly might be fit to continue as a board member? I refer the member to my previous statement. Call Robbie Butler. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answers and I thank her for her work for prison staff in recent times. I'd like to ask the Minister, has she had any discussions with the De uh, Director General of Prisons with regard to marking the centenary of Northern Ireland? No, Mr. Speaker. 
Supplementary, Mr. Butler. Yeah. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer. Would the Minister uh, just give a commitment to open uh, the line of discussion with the Deputy General, perhaps marking the occasion with a medal for those people who want a medal, perhaps? And also, would you seek to ensure that this prison service is in line with uh, other emergency services for the Platinum Jubilee Medal? Mr Speaker, I'd be happy to talk to the member um, outside the chamber um, and to get more information on what it is he requires. However, I would remind him um, that the first duty of the Director General is to ensure the prison officers and those within his care are kept safe. And at the moment, there are considerable pressures within the prison system, given COVID um, and a number of other developments. So I think we have to prioritise um, our, our actions over the next while. But I'm happy to discuss with the member and see if there is an appropriate way forward. Aram Sir Melissa McHugh, for your question, I call Melissa McHugh for a question. Carla. Uh, Minister, uh, the Finance Minister has confirmed that there is five million ring fence for legacy. Uh, can you confirm what it's going to be used for? Uh, Mr Speaker, my understanding is that there has been some confusion around this issue. So there is an amount that is ring fenced for legacy, which has been ring fenced for um, the inquests that were agreed. Um, there may also be additional legacy funding um, in terms of um, the, if you like, the work that is done by the police ombudsman and the uh, police themselves in terms of legacy litigation. Um, however, at this stage, we are working with the police ombudsman um, in terms of a business case that she has presented to us, um, an outline case, and we will work through the normal processes in that regard. The issue of legacy, however, is much more complex. Because the Secretary of State has unilaterally changed the proposals from the Stormont House Agreement um, around legacy and provided no certainty or clarity as to what will happen next, the money, for example, that was set aside as part of the NDNA commitments, um, which in total um, would have reached, I think, around $250 million, um, is not accessible to my department in order to deal with legacy issues, as it is ring-fenced specifically for setting up the structures of the Stormont House Agreement. I have written to the Secretary of State in that regard, and I have also flagged up um, and will, well, I have flagged up with the Department of Finance and will continue to do so. Um, the particular pressures and uncertainties that face my department's budget in respect um, of legacy matters. Supplementary question for Melissa. Uh, I think quite possibly you may have answered it uh, in your response because uh, I intended to ask you when would a business case be submitted for this money by the Department of Justice. But it seems sort of, I wouldn't say clear, but a wee bit confused as to who might be submitting a business case. Well, Mr Speaker, to clarify, the business case would come from the agencies which are dealing with those particular pressures, and it's the job of my department, first of all, to interrogate the robustness of the business case, um, and then to pass it once we're satisfied that it meets the test um, to the Department of Finance. Even when the business case is approved by the Department of Finance, that is not a guarantee that we will be successful when we bid for money um, from the Department of Finance for those issues. So it is a challenge, um, and we have to be honest about that. However, I have to say also to members that the challenges which face the Department and the potential costs of dealing with legacy in a piecemeal way will far exceed £5 million. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, um, with 164 weapons being found in our prisons over the last five years, what actions is she taking to make sure that our prisons are very secure and our prison officers are well protected? <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, I think that um, based on the conversation we had earlier around current supervision units and other things, it's very clear that we're taking every measure possible to ensure that our prisons are safe and often those weapons are found as a result um, of the hard work of prison service to identify those um, who either um, bring weapons into the prison, secreted on their person, um, or indeed those who fashion weapons um, within the prison system um, from materials that are available to them. We do work with complex um, and often very violent offenders in some of those cases. And so we do have to be acute to the risk that they, that they pose to themselves, to other prisoners, and to the prison service. I have to say that I am hugely impressed. It is one of the, it is one of the greatest pleasures um, of this job is to spend time in our prisons. And that may sound like an odd thing to say, Mr. Speaker, but I have the luxury of knowing that I will leave at the end of my visits, and that my visits are quite short. But I have been hugely, hugely impressed. Um, by the work of prison service. Um, the dedication and the passion that they have for rehabilitation is second to none. And I really wish that more members had the ability um, and the space, and it's unfortunate with COVID, to actually see up close what goes on within our prisons, because it is truly remarkable. 
Mr. Easton, supplementary. Um, thank the Minister for answer so far. Um, also, another worrying statistic is um, 453 items of drugs being found in our prisons over the last five years. Is there cooperation between the PSNI, the prison service, and yourselves to try and close down those avenues of drugs coming into our prisons? Thank you. Yes, it is a, a, a real concern, and obviously, when those drugs make their way into the prison system, they cause huge disruption to the prison system. They cause um, huge danger because often those illicit drugs could lead to deaths um, in the prison system. They could trigger underlying mental health conditions and a whole host of other things. But they're also, I have to say, a trigger for violence within the prison system because the street value of some of those drugs is multiplied um, by a factor of 20 when they enter the prison system. And so then you have this contraband passing through the prison um, and there is a huge amount of violence. One of the, the great difficulties in detecting drugs is that people are willing to go to extraordinary and exceptionally dangerous lengths in order to get drugs in and out of the prison, and that makes it incredibly difficult. So we have to manage that against the right for people, for example, to receive care packages from home and other things um, that might be necessary. We also need to bear in mind that the pressure on people who are put in a situation where they are trafficking drugs into the prison or attempting to do so can be extraordinary, and if they fail in their attempts, they may themselves then be at risk. And so we have to balance not only removing the drugs from the system, but also protecting the those who may have been under duress in bringing them in. I call Mervyn Storey. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her comments, particularly in relation to the, the prison service, and concur with those comments, and also confirmation that she now is looking at the issue I declare an interest as a member of the Northern Ireland Policing Board to ensure that the disgraceful comments made by the member, Mr Kelly, uh, are dealt with in a way which is in keeping with the legislation. Can I ask the Minister? Uh, what is the current situation with regards to supporting of uh, multi-agency support hubs? Some concern has been expressed both by the Committee uh, for Justice here in the House and also in correspondence to the Policing Board that that funding may possibly be removed. Mr Speaker, when the issue of support hubs um, was initially introduced, we provided additional funding on a three-year basis in order that councils could use that money um, with PCSPs and others to realign their service provision um, during that period. But the anticipation was that it would lead to a more um, a more efficient model of cooperation and therefore that there would not be ongoing costs. However, we recognise as a department that the ending um, of that funding during the COVID pandemic with all of the other challenges um, that the councils may face is difficult and therefore when we received representations from some councils who felt that they may not be able to continue with development of the support hubs in the absence of that funding, we have agreed to extend that funding now to the end of the year. We hope that that will buy us the time to be able to then review how we take this forward because I remain absolutely committed to support hubs and very impressed by the work that they do. Mr. Jury, supplementary. Uh, I thank uh, the Minister for that confirmation. It is welcome. And could I ask the Minister that she will, in the spirit of what she has responded to the concerns that have been raised, engage with uh, both the Policing Board, the PCSPs, the Councils, and the other elements of the statutory agencies to be ensure that we find a model, a funding model, which is appropriate, because obviously the work that has been achieved to date has brought success and something that we want to build on for the future. Yes, I can give him that assurance, and certainly, I mean, as I say, in terms of the support hub issue, I mean, it is something that we recognise is hugely important, and it has shown success. So it isn't something that we would want to see fall into a bend simply because of a short-term funding issue, Mr. Speaker. However, we do need to be realistic, and the member will know this. Um, sitting as he does in the policing board, and particularly looking over their resources, um, he knows that there are real strictures around some of the funding that we have available. So what we want to do um, is we've met um, already. Uh, with uh, members of SOLAS um, and with others um, in, the, uh, in the council sector. We will continue to work with police and with others. But what we want to do is find a model that is financially sustainable and efficient in terms of delivering the enhanced level um, of care um, and support in the community. I think they are an absolute exemplar um, of collaborative working. and They bring together key partners to facilitate early intervention. And early intervention ultimately itself will reap huge, huge rewards in terms of the finances of the Department, as well as in terms of people's lives and outcomes. Okay, members, time is up. If members take their ease, we'll now move to questions to the Minister for Agriculture and Environment. Just.